Happy are those who the world celebrates and who are famous. For they are the ones who rule the world. To be envied are those who are never sad and have no pain. They are the most happy of all people. Prosperous are the impatient who seize the moment and do not wait on others, for they will get ahead in life. Happy are those who cancel others and get revenge on someone who hurts them or cuts off anyone who causes them harm or separates themselves from negative people, their life will be easier. Fortunate are those who are able to seek their own success and focus on themselves, for they will be without the burdens of the needy. Happy are those who take up the offense of others and champion the cause of people who they identify with. Those who attack others openly, especially on social media, they will be considered virtuous people. Blessed are those who are never persecuted, who have easy lives, who are rich, and are surrounded with similar friends, for the kingdom of the earth belongs to them. It is such a blessing when others compliment you and tell you how great you are, even if they are insincere. Be glad and rejoice, because great is your reward on earth. Y'all, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about our new kingdom. We've been talking about the difference between the new kingdom and the old kingdom. We've been talking about the temptation of the kingdom of the earth. And today our passage brings us to values. The values of the earthly kingdom and the values of the heavenly kingdom could not be more opposite. I ask you this morning, where is your reward? Is your reward great on earth? Or is it great in heaven? Seems like Oftentimes, the object of Christianity can become trying to store up as much treasure as we can in both places. We want as much treasure here without detrimenting our treasure there as well. And we want as much treasure there without hurting our treasure here too much. Is your reward in heaven? Is your reward on earth? Is your kingdom in heaven? Or is your kingdom on earth? And the world has these values. Do you live by the values of the kingdom of heaven? Or do you live by the values of the kingdom of the earth? You know, the world tells us how to live. They try to tell us how to live. They have all these values that they shove down your throat. In media, every movie you watch, every Netflix channel, every show, it has values that are that are pushed throughout the fabric of that media. And they are the values of the world. The news media, they celebrate the values of the world. The universities, they teach the values of the world. Every class, you cannot go to a university class. I don't care if it's biology. I don't care if it's math without having that class being infected by some of the root philosophies of the world. They push the values of the world. The advertisements, they prey upon the values of the world. They want you to value the things of the world so that they can sell you the things of the world. Every subject in your children's school. The children's TV programs, if you watch them, the magazines in the department stores, they are all telling us to value the things of the world. Here are three values, there are many more, but here are three of the values of the world that I believe have really infected us and our culture today. The first is this idea that we must find your purpose. 
If you put up the first slide. Oh, I didn't give you slides, did I? Shame on me. Oh, my goodness. Steve, you even reminded me. They're really good slides. It's been a tough weekend when your wife is gone, I'll tell you. <laughs> all right, I got an amen over there. All right, all right, I'm just going to have to give it to you all. The, you're going to have to take good notes, y'all, all right? All right, so here's the first one, and it has find your purpose. Find your purpose. You need to find your own purpose. And this is rooted in the philosophies of existentialism. The idea of existentialism is that there is no overall general purpose for the world. And so you need to find your own purpose or you do not have one at all. And so the suicide rates skyrocket. Depression hits because people do not have their purpose. Or when they find their purpose and they seek it, they realize in the end that there's no value there. But they seek their own purpose. They, they, they seek, find what you're good at, find what you want to do, and seek that. That is the value of the world. The problem is we do not need a value, we do not need to find a purpose. We need to find a king and surrender to him. You see, our king has already given us a purpose. The purpose is to glorify him, and he's given us, uh, he's given us gifts, unique gifts that we can serve him from. We don't need to find our purpose. We need to discover how God created us to fulfill his purpose. A, a second one is that we should optimize pleasure and minimize pain. This is rooted in hedonism. The idea that anything is good, anything that is pleasurable, anything that you desire, you should maximize that in your life. You should do whatever makes you feel good. And anything that makes you feel bad is painful is bad. Anything that causes you pain is evil. Today, over $300 billion a year are spent on pain medication so that we can reduce the pain that we find in this world. Everywhere we look, the world is telling us that we need to optimize what makes us feel good, and we need to minimize pain. This is a value of our society. A, a third one, a, a third one, and, and I think this is the most prevalent today in today's culture, is that the individual is of primary importance. This is rooted in the philosophy of individualism. It tells you that the most important thing about any culture is the individual person. And so whatever is good for you, you need to find what's good for you and do that. You need to self-promote. You need to do what's best for yourself. You need to sacrifice others in order to take care of you. You need some me time. And this lie results in us replacing God with ourselves. The problem is, these values are temporary. The pain always comes, and in the end, these values lead to death. But God's values, God's values, they are upside down. And His values bring blessing. You see, in His kingdom... The God is sacrificed. The leaders serve. The poor are exalted. Those who seek after God are those who are blessed. Look down with me at our text, chapter 5, verse 1. It says, when he, being Jesus, saw the crowds, he went up into the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are not rich, who don't have the things all figured out, who aren't prideful, who say, oh, I'm, I, I'm doing it well spiritually. You know, as you drive by a poor person on the side of the road, you've all done it, you drive by them and you look and you see someone who's holding up that cardboard sign. And sometimes you stop and you roll down your window and you hand something to them. And when you do, there's a look in their eye. 
It's a look of embarrassment because they know they are not worth anything. They're sitting there poor. They know that they have nothing to recommend them. They have nothing inherently good in themselves. They're probably going to take whatever you give them and spend them on something that they shouldn't. And you can see it in their eyes. And this is how we are supposed to be in our spirit toward God. We have nothing to recommend us before God. We're supposed to be humble before Him. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, y'all we're probably going to take those blessings and spend it in a way we shouldn't anyway. He said, the kingdom of heaven, it belongs to someone who is poor in spirit. The next one, this one's tough. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who cry. Blessed are those who have pain, who experience loss. I don't know if anything could be farther in in tension with the world's culture today. Like, how do you even understand that? We have been brought up to understand that any pain is evil. And here he is saying, blessed are those who mourn. This is how confusing this is. I was reading a commentary. Uh, this, This is several years ago. I was reading a commentary on this passage. And this commentator was so confused by this that he had the audacity to rip apart scripture and put something in there that, he, that, that didn't belong because he could not reconcile this. He, he said this. He said, this passage really means blessed are those who mourn for their sin. Your version say that? That's how anti-culture the kingdom's values are. You see, the kingdom says, blessed are those who never mourn. The kingdom of the earth says, blessed are those who never mourn. The kingdom of heaven says, blessed are those who are comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Or blessed are the humble. Blessed are those who don't work for themselves, who don't self-promote, who don't get up front and say, it's all about me. Blessed are those who aren't all about an individual, who have not, who have rejected this idea that they are the most important thing in life. Blessed are those people. They're going to inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. This word filled here gives an an idea of satisfaction. Satisfaction, they're totally satisfied. Like you after Thanksgiving dinner, you're like, oh, no more, right? You're you're completely satisfied. It says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be satisfied. Are you satisfied this morning? Do you feel satisfied? You know, we look around the world and we get obsessed with more, more money, more influence, a bigger house, a nicer car, more of this, more friends on Facebook, more, 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 and we're never satisfied. The world teaches us not to be satisfied. The minute you're satisfied, you fall behind. But the world, but God says, no, you hunger and thirst after righteousness, I will fill you up. This next one, this next one's hard. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who forgive. Blessed are those who don't take up an offense, who don't don't strike back and get revenge, who don't cancel those who have hurt them. Blessed are those who set the captives free, who say, you know what, I I see your sin, but I am going to forgive you out out of the goodness of my heart. Blessed are those who give mercy. They will receive mercy. They'll receive the mercy of God. This idea of mercy is a judicial term of letting a captive free. You know, there, there's this lady named Cory Ten Boom. Cory Ten Boom was a, a prisoner in, in a Nazi prison camp for many years. And, and she once said, 
To be merciful or, or to forgive is to set a captive free and to realize that the captive was you. Isn't that powerful? If we're merciful, if we forgive, then we receive mercy. The world tells us different. God says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who seek God with all of their heart, who don't have the things of the world pulling down on them. They will see God. I want to see God. I want to see God. What about y'all? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. They will be called Christ-like. They will be called Christians. The peacemakers. The ones who say, I know there's a conflict here, but we're going to try to bring peace to that conflict. The, the ones who don't, instead of taking up the offense and causing more friction, who say, oh no, we are going to be in here to love and to care. This is what a Christian is supposed to be like. This is what someone is supposed to see that and say, oh, you're a son of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, what about this one? Blessed are those who are persecuted. What? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. You see, when you live by the values of the kingdom instead of the values of the world, you will be persecuted. But God will bless you. It says you are blessed when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I ask you again, is your reward great on earth or is your reward great in heaven? Is my reward great on earth? Is my reward great in heaven? You see, y'all, the values of the kingdom, they are upside down. The God is sacrificed. The leaders serve. The poor are exalted. The last are first. And the persecuted are blessed. And I had a great slide right here. And here's what it says. It says, how should we live? We should live by the values of the kingdom of heaven. Y'all, ha have you ever been to a gym and, uh, and someone walks in with jeans on? You know, they walk in, let's say, what, like a polo and jeans on. They go and start like messing around with the weights and everyone's just kind of like, what are you doing here? All right, I lost y'all. Um, I had a picture to illustrate this. All right, I'm just going to describe the picture. Uh, there's a bunch of puppies, and there's a turtle in the middle of them trying to hang out. Okay. That's how we're supposed to be in the world. We're supposed to be really, when we live according to the values of the kingdom, we're supposed to not fit in. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to stand out. You see, God calls us to live differently. He calls us to be meek. He calls us to forgive. He calls us to be pure in heart. He calls us to care for others and not care for ourselves. Tom and Gloria Thurman. Uh, Y'all probably have never heard of them. They, they live in Columbia, Mississippi. And, and at the church there, uh, Tom, he, he's 90 years old. And he greets at the side door. He's not pretentious enough to take the front door. He greets at the side door, hands out bulletins, and greets people as they come in. He, he's quite a talker, but he never says a negative word about anybody. It's always positive. I, it's amazing. He can come up with the most positive things about all sorts of things. But he's always talking about positive. He, he's always building others up. And he has such a meek, humble attitude. His wife, Gloria, uh, she's more of a doer. She, uh, she, she's not as much of a talker, but she's the epitome of see a need, meet a need. If she sees a need, she's going to meet it. She leads up the bereavement committee there. They got committees for everything. Um, but, but she leads that up, taking care of those who have lost a loved one. 
if you meet them, you would never know that they are national heroes in a country halfway around the world named Bangladesh. You see, they were missionaries there, and there wasn't a lot of traction going, uh, attraction going on, but then there was a civil war that broke out. And the civil war broke out between what was then East Pakistan, uh, Pakistan, and, and, and Pakistan, and, and it became, East Pakistan became Bangladesh. And everybody left. Every Western person left during this war except Tom and Gloria Thurman. They stayed. They loved. They earned the, the trust of the people as they, they became peacemakers to protect those who were persecuted in the area because of what religion they were in, whether it was Muslim or Hindu or, or what have you. And today, I, I don't have the number, but there are many, many, many churches in that area, and there are more being planted every day. And as far as they can tell, every one of those churches can in some way be traced back to Tom and Gloria Thurman. And that's how we should live our lives. We should live our lives with compassion. We should live our lives in meekness. We should live our lives as peacemakers. We should live according to the values of the kingdom. When we live according to the values of the kingdom, it impacts the world in a way that we cannot when we pretend to live in one area, but we really live by the values of the world. No, we must live with compassion. We must move past our own hurts. We must move past our selfishness, past our persecution. Why? Take a look at verse 13. Verse 13 says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how is it to be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and to trample under people's feet. Y'all, have you ever had tofu? I, I, and when I say tofu, I mean raw tofu. Okay, my mom drew, grew up in Japan, and every once in a while she would make some Japanese food, and she'd have these tofu squares. And, and they just, they're, they're white, rubbery little things, okay? And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to dip them in things to get flavor out of them, okay? So you dip them in something, and the flavor gets in it, and then you eat it. But if you ever take one of those squares and just eat it by itself, it's just bland, mushy, blech. And that's what we are if we don't live by the values of the kingdom. Jesus is saying, look, Israel, you were supposed to be different. You were supposed to be set apart. You were supposed to be the flavor of the world. Jesus is saying, you were supposed to be the flavor. You were supposed to be the salt that brought out the other flavors. But no, you're being like the world. You're just as selfish as the Romans. You're just as prideful as the Greeks. You're just as angry as the Gentiles. You have no more flavor. And today, y'all, we must, as Christians, supply the flavor. You know, have you ever been across from somebody when they took that bite of delicious food, their eyes just light up? That's how we should be. We, we should be so flavorful that people are sitting there on Yelp talking about us. Yelp is an app for those who have a flip phone, okay? We got to stick together. No, we, we got to be patient just how he is. We got to love just how Jesus is. And this is how we bring flavor. Otherwise, it says we are useless thrown out. It's good for nothing. It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. This is our purpose, and if we will not do it, we become useless in our lives. So here's the next slide that you won't see. How should we live? We should live differently. We should live differently. You can write, we should live flavorful. You know, it's hard not to live like the world. But we need to flee the influences of the world and seek the values of the kingdom. Let's look at the next couple of verses. It says in verse 14, You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill, it cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Y'all imagine you're walking along a dark path and you have a flashlight in your hand and you have your hand over it. 
And so you're still stumbling along, even though you got your flashlight, because you're covering it up and you cannot see. And Jesus is saying, Israel, you're supposed to be the light of the world. And he gets this from, pas- from many passages of the Old Testament. One, though, I'm going to read for you. It's in Isaiah chapter uh, 60. Man, it's a long book. All right, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. It says this, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. It's talking about Israel. For look, darkness will cover the earth, and total darkness the people's. But the Lord will shine over you, and his glory will appear over you. The nations will come to your light, and the kings to your shining brightness. This is what's supposed to happen. Israel is supposed to be so seeking after God, and such a light to the world, that the other nations of the world come flocking to Israel to say, what's different about you? How can we serve your God? How can we be in your light? We, we're sick of living in darkness. Let's come, to, let's come to Israel because they are the light. And Jesus is saying, that's how you were supposed to be. But that's not how they were living. Y'all, y'all I, I don't know if there are any Hasidic Jew compounds around here. Uh, many of you might have gone to Israel and, and, and had a run-in or two. I live next to one in New York. And, and they won't interact with you because an interaction with you makes them unholy. So they become very rude people. What they do is they're very judgmental towards you and, and your lifestyle and anything that you do. And so when they come to serve your home, you know, because they, they, they work around in the area and they'll come and they'll, they'll fix something at your house or they'll, they'll work on it, but they won't really talk to you or interact with you. If you're at Walmart and they're at Walmart and you say hello, they are going to ignore you and walk right by. This is how the Jewish people were treating the other, pe- the other nations. This is how they were treating the Samaritans. This is how they were treating the Romans and the Greeks and the Gentiles. They were walking right by them and saying, oh no, you're unclean. And so instead of being a light to them to attract them to Jesus, they were doing the opposite. They were pushing them away. And y'all, the same is true for us. We cannot be a judgmental Christian who says, oh no, you are of the world. We cannot be somebody who lives by the values of the world because that's what happens, right? It, it is, it, it's a value of the world that has permutated into the Jewish culture at the time and sometimes into the church today where we start becoming prideful and we start, we start acting like the world, but acting, what, but saying that we follow Christ. And so instead of attracting them to Jesus, we are still the same, acting the same as the world, and so we are pushing them away from God. I, I don't know if you all remember, in 2006 there was a mass shooting that happened at an Amish school. Do you all remember that? There was a man who walked into an Amish school for girls, ages 5 to 13, and shot 10 of them, killing five. And in the aftermath of this, you know, he had a wife and a family. In the aftermath of this, the Amish community poured out forgiveness on this family. They went to the family to comfort them for their loss. And they said, we must forgive because this is what God calls us. We can't have bitterness toward them. And you know what the media said? The media was like, isn't this cool? But that makes sense, because they're Amish. When's the last time somebody forgave someone and someone said, well, that makes sense, they're a Christian? When's the last time someone did some good work and they're like, well, that, that well, obviously, they go, to, they go to that Baptist church. You see, we have no longer a reputation of living by the values of the kingdom, we have built a reputation that we live in both worlds. How should we live? This is another slide. How should we live? We should live in such a way that God is glorified. Verse 16 there says, Let your light so shine before others so they see your good works and they give glory to your Father in heaven. Y'all, I know. It's hard not to live like the world. It's hard. We, we struggle with it 
every day. But y'all, we must do good works. We must be called to a greater living. We must call to greater values. We must live according to kingdom values in order to reach our purpose. And so here's my challenge for you this week. Last week, the challenge was see a need, meet a need. And this one's similar, but the challenge is to do so to somebody who is not a Christian. And you might have done it last week. Do it again this week. It's okay. God will let it slide. Okay? See a need for somebody who is a non-Christian, who does not live in the light, and meet a need for them. Whether it's through prayer, whether it's bringing them a meal, whether it's sending them a note, be an encouragement to them. Let our good works glorify God. Y'all, if we will take the basket off the candlestick, the light will shine. Let's pray.